Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Immigration and the border have been some of the most defining issues in American and global politics over the past 10 years. I know folks are definitely going to have a lot of questions about this topic, considering the news with the U.S.-Mexico border, debates about asylum, and of course, the standoff between the state of Texas and the federal government. But I think to understand all of those daily news questions, you have to take a step back and understand the broader context. Therefore, I'm speaking with the author and New Yorker writer, Jonathan Blitzer. He's written an excellent book about the broader context of U.S. immigration policy, especially the increasing focus on Central America rather than just the focus on Mexican immigrants, which was really the defining way we thought of this issue back in the 2000s. The book is called Everyone Who Has Gone Is Here, and I really recommend it. And this conversation itself is really focused on answering these big questions in the context of everything we've learned over the past decade and 40 years of American history. So hope you all enjoy the conversation and a huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Jonathan Blitzer, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. So I think the key thing for an episode and a book like this is that folks are going to have so many different questions that are going to be really answered via the narrative, but I just want to want to jump around. Um, read the book, sure. took notes. So big question for you here. I am 31 years old, so a lot of my initial thoughts on immigration and everything is really centered in the 2000s, obviously, where this is primarily, as you write, a story about the U.S. and Mexico. That's how we're thinking about immigration issues. Um, since 2014, however, in these various border crises, issues, pick your euphemism, it's really been much more centered on Central America. So starting here first, what is the biggest implication of the shift from a Mexico-centric migration debate to a Central American-centric migration debate? Sure. I mean, the, the real question at the core of it all, at the core of kind of the different demographic shifts, is basically what the typical profile is of someone who's arriving at the southern border and, and, and what it is that they're seeking. And so the kind of key takeaway from the years leading up to 2014 and then the early 2000s was that, that the types of people who were typically showing up in the greatest numbers at the southern border were single men from Mexico crossing the border looking for work. The shift that we started to see in the kind of you know late 2010s around that really kind of came to the fore in 2014 was that you had unaccompanied children and families from Central America seeking asylum. And one of the reasons why this was such a profound shift was just in terms of the sheer number of people showing up just absolutely overwhelmed the system at that moment in time. But the reason it overwhelmed the system was that it's much harder to process people who show up seeking asylum because by law, the U.S. has to hear their asylum claims. It has to find some way of holding them while it hears the asylum claim. It needs to send that asylum claim through uh, the immigration court system. There is a whole process that gets built up around an asylum claim and it becomes really burdensome and hard to manage uh, when you have high volumes of people coming at a steady clip, all seeking asylum. And so now, actually, what's interesting about the, the precise moment which we're talking now is that the, the profile is shifting yet again. Central Americans are still crossing the border or showing up at the border in large numbers seeking asylum. But you now also have more people from South America. You have more of a global population. And again, all of them now are seeking asylum at the southern border which presents a real administrative challenge to the system because there is a requirement by law to, to hear people's claims. And so, you know, it, it requires resources, time, a great deal of thought and, and organization operationally. Yeah. So, and I think what's so interesting about the demographics changing is that if let's just say you're a generic centrist, and I'm not saying this disparagingly, but if you're a center uh, politician in the 20 in the 2000s, the response to single young men is, hey, like, what's passed a guest worker program? There are, there, there are some pretty straightforward responses you could introduce into the political system that, separate from the debate over them, you could see as being a response to that dynamic in the first place. They're going to come here for a few years. They're going to work. We have work issues. They go back. They remit back to Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What mm -hmm. policy options do the center kind of have to the 2014 and onwards direction, because nothing immediately comes to mind. And, and obviously, like the guest worker programs didn't pass, but you at least had a straightforward, we could just lay this out on the table option yeah. that people could have gone with. So I'd love to hear your articulation. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I think 
you kind of have a convergence of problems, first of all. I mean, before you can even get to what some policy solutions might look like to a large number of asylum seekers at the southern border, you do have to reckon with the fact that for complex but understandable reasons, you had around 2014 a kind of collision of things that redefine the political and policy debates surrounding immigration in the US. The first is, you know, you have comprehensive immigration reform moving through Congress at that moment in time. It passed the Senate, a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform bill passed the Senate in 2013. It died in the Republican controlled House where the speaker at the time, John Boehner, refused to bring it up for vote. Um, one of the reasons it died in the way that it did at the, the time that it did was that you had increasingly sort of um, a turbulent situation at the southern border where Republicans could game out that moment politically. And also, don't forget Eric Cantor. There is you actually see a very literal example of someone uh, who a future speaker losing his role because of a debate over immigration. Well, exactly, exactly, and that you know, people inside the Obama administration, for instance, at the time said that when Cantor lost his primary in 2014, that was kind of the beginning of the end. That's when they realized the bottom fell out of the comprehensive immigration reform push. But of course, you see a pairing for political purposes of blaming the border, you know, kind of writing off the prospect of immigration reform um, with the kind of pretext uh, that the border is just out of control. We have to get the border under control first. So Republicans in Congress were slow walking immigration reform and, and resisting it in the House. You have the border crisis that flares up simultaneously to the kind of final throes of this comprehensive reform effort. And then what begins to happen is because politically it gets harder and harder to reform the immigration system, you have a system that's increasingly antiquated and outdated and isn't, isn't retooled or, or, or able to respond to the world as we're living in it. Um, and so what starts to happen is the types of people who are showing up at the southern border are people who, you know, a, a lot of them have legitimate asylum claims. A lot don't. A lot, a lot of people are crossing for a number of different reasons, poverty, extreme weather events, family reunification, whatever it may be. If the system could be reformed in a more thoroughgoing way, there would be other legal avenues for these people to come to the United States legally and work legally in the United States. But increasingly, what you start to see during these years is the door on reforming the system in other ways, on expanding legal immigration, keeps shutting. And so the pressure point increasingly becomes the southern border and, and seeking asylum at the southern border. To your question concretely about, okay, how, how do you handle an influx of people at the southern border, all of whom need to have their asylum claims heard. There are kind of two categories, as I think about it, for understanding what some of the policy options are. The first sound honestly very technocratic, but they do matter. Um, things like uh, hiring more immigration judges, um, increasing staffing at um, uh, an agency called Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, where there are asylum officers who hear the who basically have the initial asylum screening with migrants who arrive. You know, there are all kinds of things. There are things you can do to help reduce the backlog in immigration courts, because that poses a very specific and concrete problem for processing future claims. Some of these reforms had been undertaken before. Some of these measures, I mean, it wasn't a great mystery that these things would help. Uh, they had been undertaken before. There was a smaller scale asylum crisis in the early 90s. And these kinds of measures helped. What had changed between the 90s and 2014 was just the scale. And so I think in the longer term, and this leads to the second category of things, um, you know, in in essence, what the thinking has to begin to evolve toward, and it's just hard to imagine given our politics, is that there needs to be some way of processing people and hearing their claims before they reach the U.S. southern border. So in an ideal world where things weren't mired in, you know, partisan bickering all the time and where Congress could do some basic functions, um, there would be an adult conversation about the fact that, okay, there are so many people who are seeking asylum and, and relief at the southern border. Maybe there are ways of setting up regional processing centers in Latin America or allowing people to apply from their home countries before they leave so that you're not dealing with this sudden operational disaster when everyone shows up at the southern border. But for that to happen, that requires time and money and 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 a kind of political fortitude. And like all of those things are in short supply. What's the difference between remain in Mexico during the Trump era and that then? Because a, a smarter Trump administration would just say things like these are regional processing centers. But there's also so, you, so what's the dip, what, what's the difference between what you just advocated and what Trump was doing? A lot. I mean, I, I should say one thing about what 
what Trump did with Remain in Mexico. That idea of Remain in Mexico, which, you know, was essentially taking people who showed up at the southern border who were seeking asylum, shunting them into northern Mexico and saying, look, you have to wait here while the system sort of slowly grinds on and as we eventually move your case through the system. That idea itself, I mean, this is kind of the classic Trump problem. Uh, the way the Trump administration instituted that idea um, and the way they kind of thought of that idea um, was full of bad faith and it was deliberately shoddy and there were there was no real regard for the people's lives who were caught up in this new system. Um, that idea itself wasn't so outlandish if you are having this conversation in mm -hmm. government circles in the 20, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, the idea that maybe there needs to be a, a more serious and sustained international operation along the US-Mexico border where you have you know, international organizations, maybe the UN is involved, maybe the, you know, the International Office of Migration is involved, kind of doing different outreach and coordination so that people can wait safely in Mexico. There are versions, in other words, of Remain in Mexico that weren't the Trumpiest version, where the, the well-being of people was, you know, could be factored in. I'm not saying that that was ever uh, an idea that was fully advanced or fully, fully fleshed out. The only version of the idea we ever saw was the Trump administration's remain in Mexico, which was obviously catastrophic. The setting up regional, um, you know, sort of processing centers is, is different in that your goal, if you were to set up offices all over Latin America, is you are trying to get people to apply, to, to you know, to, to lodge their claims, to, to set this process in motion. You're not reacting to people who are arriving and then kind of shunting them off to a foreign government. Instead, you're basically leaving the door open to their coming to the United States, but you're, you're, you're acknowledging the fact that there needs to be some way to manage the flow. So there are different kind of categories. I mean, what's so strange about all of this is the operations are pretty limited. I mean, there, there aren't that many permutations of sort of like what the core level operations could look like. There's like the ugly version of things, which Trump has really, I, I think, displayed the kind of fallout of. And then there are there are versions that I think are complicated, but that are, are less well tested that, you know, maybe would be a way of dealing with some of this problem. Yeah, I feel like knowing a bunch of people who worked in the Trump administration, if we're going to get real about what's going on here is not only is that remain in Mexico policy designed as a deterrent, um, for, under the theory that deterrence is the way that you reduce the migrants coming in. But I'd also would verge that there's much less consensus in favor of our current asylum policy than I'd say public discourse would, would really suggest. Because doing the process you're describing with the regional processing centers suggests that, hey, like this is a legitimate process. And if there are people who like aren't quite shouldn't be there, there's a world where like half of the people who show up are going to come in. I think that'd be a situation that Trump people would find objectionable. So I guess like the question I really asked for you is like, what would you actually say the mm -hmm. consensus on whether or not administration support or are unhappy with the current law on asylum? Like, what would you say that situation is? You know, one top DHS official recently told me that like the way to understand having this conversation is to embrace the fact that there's simply no center. There's no agreement at all. I think okay. there's disagreement every way you look. I think the kind of core animating principle of the Republican side of the debate, particularly from the Trump years on, is an opposition to immigration in all forms. And that this is not a tendentious view, to be clear. I mean, this is just a, 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 an accounting of not only what their statements of intent were, but yeah. their actual track record. They wanted to restrict legal immigration as well as illegal immigration to the United States. On the other side, I think there's a lot on the Democratic side. I think there is honestly a lot of disagreement and a lot of um, uneasiness about how to move forward. I think everyone in some form or another recognizes the fact that the asylum system needs to be retooled. I, I don't think that that is um, uh, an unfair concession to make. I mean, the numbers are simply too high. Um, the, the, the resources simply aren't there. There needs to be some way of dealing with this problem more systematically. There's total disagreement about the best way to do that. Um, but I think most Democrats would, you know, some publicly, others privately say, yeah, there, we have a problem here. The system just isn't built for the reality of the world. Um, but I, I think until there's a viable path through Congress, all of this is essentially academic because there's just no hope. I mean, we're watching a debate play out right now in the Senate where the mm -hmm. terms are extremely conservative. 
And the Republicans can't even all get on board in the Senate to say nothing of the Republican House. And that is for an incredibly minor, or, or I should say narrow, aspect of the asylum system. That's not comprehensive immigration reform. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's hard. And I think a kind of inconvenient fact for progressive-minded people like myself, honestly, is the fact that the majority of people who show up at the southern border seeking asylum don't qualify for asylum according to the actual language of the statute. Um, and so the question then is what you do with that. Um, you know, a kind of more humane, thoughtful way of looking at that population is to say, okay, well, their need, their reasons for coming to the border are no less urgent, but maybe it's wrong to have kind of frozen the entire immigration system in place and assume that the only way to deal with people is through the asylum system. Maybe there are people who are fleeing, you know, climate change or endemic poverty or, you know, or violence that doesn't amount to persecution per se, but maybe there are other ways that they could apply for entry into the U.S., that isn't strictly speaking through the asylum system at the southern border. Yeah, could you explain, given that, could you explain two buckets and maybe, I don't want to say valid because that seems you know pejorative, but like what are reasons for asylum seeking that the system allows for? And what are ones mm -hmm. that we could be sympathetic towards but ultimately don't qualify under the letter of the law? Like, what are those two yeah. buckets? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I say this is very, you know, this is very personal for me and, and I know for a lot of other journalists and, and legal advocates who work on this because, you know, you meet people who's, who are, you know, traveling to the US because their life depends on it. And there's like this technical question of what the statute says on asylum. So the, the law itself basically identifies different kinds of identity-based persecution. Um, and so if, you know, if, if what you're fleeing doesn't fall under these very specific categories of identity-based persecution, um, it's often an uphill battle to win in an immigration court, I should say. It depends where you apply for asylum. There's mm -hmm. also notorious variance from immigration court to immigration court. So for instance, if you're seeking asylum in Illinois, you have a much better chance of getting it than if you were seeking asylum in Texas. Um, that's a problem. I mean, that seems kind of crazy and random, but is a fact of our system as well. There's a lot of subjectivity in how these cases get adjudicated. And quick thing, um, to understand how that situation happens, um, assuming aside someone flies into Chicago O'Hare from somewhere, are you describing the person's applying in Chicago as being someone who like got to Texas, I'm in Austin, so got here and then mm -hmm. was bussed to Illinois and then they're applying to have their case adjudicated there? Like, I'm just trying to understand like why- How when, someone why, would end up in Illinois yeah, rather yeah. than Texas. I mean, there are different ways, there are a few different ways it can happen. I mean, one way you can apply for asylum, you have basically by law right now, and this, you know, if the Senate deal moves forward and passes again, which I don't think is likely, you have a year when you enter the US you have a year during which you can apply for asylum. Um, and then if that year passes and you haven't applied for asylum, the law basically says you're out of luck. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are different ways you can apply for asylum. You can cross the border in between ports of entry. This is what's commonly referred to as illegal or irregular migration, crossing between ports of entry, getting apprehended by border patrol. And when you're apprehended saying, I, I want to seek asylum, I've, cr I've, cr I've, I've crossed the border in, in, in pursuit of asylum. And that then starts your process. And so technically they put you in what are called removal proceedings. It's the sort of burden falls on you in a way to mm -hmm. prove that you have a legitimate asylum claim, but that's one way to do it. And then there's also a kind of um, a different way of applying where, you know, you proactively file an application. You, maybe you come to the U.S. legally or mm -hmm. you arrive in the U.S. in some other fashion and you apply that way once you're here or at a port of entry. And that would, you know, move the process forward in a different way. And depending on, you know, where maybe you're reuniting with family in Illinois, maybe, you know, that's where you've settled. That's how you end up with a case there rather than say in Texas or in California. Um, so to, to your earlier question, um, you know, there are these different forms of identity-based persecution that the asylum law is built around. Over the years, what counts as identity-based persecution has evolved a bit. So legal advocates have made claims that, for instance, if you're living in Central America and you have been victimized by a violent street gang, um, technically, the way the statute was written in 1980, there was no consideration of a world in which a gang like MS-13 would effectively be a shadow state in a country like El Salvador. Um, so. You know, oh, so what, what the, is this? That's fascinating. Okay, yeah, exactly. Go on. So yeah. there's, there's this question of like, okay, 
you know, it's one thing if you're fleeing state repression, that kind of fits a more classic definition of asylum. The state is persecuting me because I'm gay or because I, uh, I'm Jewish or wh whatever it may be. Um, it's different when you're getting victimized by a gang that kind of is maybe the de facto government of a country. It kind of runs the day-to-day -day life of a country, but technically isn't the government. And what why is the key case? thing? Why is the gang victimized? So why is MS MS thirteen that situation? What what are they doing and why are they doing it? Well, it would, you know, and it, it would it would depend it would depend kind of what what form of violence and harassment and persecution mm -hmm. uh, someone can claim is happening. Um, but I think over over time there have been different there have been kind of a there's been a wider understanding of how we should understand persecution based on the original terms of the statute to try to account for some of the kind of messier realities of day-to-day -day life in the region and beyond. Okay. Um, even so, you know, it, it, to give you a concrete example, um, you know, uh, a, 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 a domestic violence victim um, who flees, say, Guatemala and comes to the United States seeking asylum can now make a more identity-based argument that, you know, misogy violent misogyny is so pervasive in Guatemala or, or in her community in Guatemala, that there is an identity-based reason why she is seeking protection in the United States. And that a broader understanding of the context of her identity in Guatemala, to use this example, is what would make her eligible for asylum under these terms. So like you have these kinds of things, but even over and above all of that, a lot of what we're seeing right now, for instance, uh, migrants coming from Venezuela. You know, Venezuela is run by a teetering, repressive socialist government. The economy has completely collapsed. Something like 5 million people have left since 2014. Um, you know, the state has completely crumbled. Um, there's a kind of vigilantism that governs life on the streets. There's not food. Inflation is out of control. People have no choice but to leave the country. So what happens when a Venezuelan fleeing those circumstances arrives at the border and seeks asylum? You know, right now, because the numbers are so great, there are, there are different things that the government is doing. But like in theory, that person wouldn't necessarily, unless they have a very specific case they could make, isn't fleeing persecution. It might be a generalized state of violence. Mm -hmm. So then there's this immediate question of, okay, well, so how can the law accommodate someone who's fleeing for urgent reasons, who's, who's not trying to game the system in bad faith, who's you know bringing his or her family north because it's their only option? How can they come to the United States legally? What moral and legal obligation can the US, does the, does the United States have to respond to someone like that outside of the very specific terms of the 1980 Refugee Act, which is what sets forth the language in the statute? I guess what I wonder then, especially given the Venezuelan example is, if yeah. you are fleeing justifiably Venezuela, you're passing through Colombia, you're going to go to Panama, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How does that not affect the asylum claim? Because um, mm -hmm. once again, you're, Colombia has its issues, but it's definitely not 1990s or 2000s Colombia. So if it's purely for persecution or state collapse, mm -hmm. I, I guess, I, I think I think this yeah. is where I think people in good faith can be kind of confused about how the system works. Yeah. Um, why can you, why, why aren't you applying for asylum in Colombia? Yeah. Listen, you know, you're hitting on, you know, what this, just to step back just for one second, because I think yeah, it's a really please. good question. Like one of the things that's so complicated in the journalistic space around this is there are all of these very legitimate and complex questions, which is like one you just asked. And then there's the like political overlay that, <laughs> it means you know, kind of <laughs> mystify, you know, just sort of, you know, you lose the strain. But, but basically, you know, this is a, this is a, a policy question that, you know, Democrats and Republicans, um, have, have raised that list, you know, you, you might hear it. Um, you might he hear the phrase, a safe third country agreement, uh, or, you know, um, anyway, I can get very technical with some of the terms that are used, but there's a little bit of this idea that, listen, if people are crossing through other countries, maybe that should make them ineligible to apply for asylum in the United States. I think I explaining why, um, you know, traveling through another country shouldn't make someone ineligible in the United States. There are a few reasons, you know, one is, um, there's a there's a real question of in these other countries what their asylum systems look like if they're actually capable of processing you for asylum you know so mm -hmm. a country like um Guatemala for instance the Trump administration tried to create a deal with the Guatemalan government where any central american or south american crossing through Guatemala uh would autom and if if they were to 
eventually reached the United States would get deported to Guatemala, where they would then have to file an asylum claim. That doesn't sound so outlandish, but then you look at the fact that, okay, first of all, the, at that time, the majority of people f- coming to the United States were from Guatemala, which is to say mm-hmm. the state of affairs in Guatemala was pretty dire to begin with. But the Guatemalan government had at that time something like 12 asylum officers in the entire country. Um, which is to say, if large numbers of people started to show up seeking asylum, they wouldn't have the resources to even deal with it. Um, so there are there are these kinds of questions. And I also think another thing that we're seeing right now that even just adds another layer of complexity mm-hmm. is, you know, you might remember in uh, the fall of 2021, there were something like 15,000 Haitians. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, you'll remember this specifically because you're in Texas, um, who got stuck under the Del Rio Bridge on the US-Mexico border. And a lot of those Haitians, the vast majority of people who got stuck under that bridge, um, coming to the US, trying to gain entry and getting blocked and eventually deported to Haiti, had not been living in Haiti. They had been living in Chile and in other countries in the region. They had already fled Haiti. They may have fled Haiti a decade ago, um, started to live in other places, to resettle in other places. And as a result of all of the economic fallout that followed COVID, basically found themselves living in a place where jobs were suddenly scarce. There was a kind of economic anxiety in the country. There was a racism that flared up, a populism that flared up, and they were forced to leave. So, you know, there are all there are also these dislocations that occur even along the migratory route that make it a little bit more complicated than to say, oh, all right, well, listen, if you've landed in another country, shouldn't you be fine there? I mean, there, there's, it, there's just a lot of complex global forces that are at play. You know, I'd love for you to and maybe we had asylum policies before 1980, kind of explain what the rationale at the time is. Because as you are articulating all these challenges, I myself, and I'm sure most listeners are going to think of like the SS St. Louis, like the nightmare scenario for why we have have an asylum policy, aka for those who don't know, um, you know, pre-World War II, there's literally like a a ship full of um, Jews who are fleeing um, Europe, they try to come to the United States, they're not let in, they go to Cuba, they're not allowed in, they go back, and then half of them like outright die um, in the Holocaust. That's the definition of a place, by the way, which the response to them being German Jews was not, oh, just move to Holland, oh, just move to France, um, right. especially considering the collaboration that happened like thereafter. So that's like the perfect case of, no, 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 like the United States had to be the final destination mm-hmm. for European Jews, given the mm-hmm. circumstances and fascism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I could totally see in that mm-hmm. context why we'd be where we are. But is that the situation that a policymaker in 1980 is thinking of when they're thinking about asylum policy? I think it's a it's a combination of things that come in, come into play in 1980. I mean, obviously, there's this horrible checkered history of you know humanitarian failures like that one, which should haunt everyone. Um, but what was what was happening increasingly was there wasn't a there wasn't a systematic policy for dealing with refugees and asylum seekers. So what would happen is there'd be an international emergency or a crisis, say people fleeing Vietnam after the mm. fall of Saigon, um, and there'd be tens of thousands of refugees, and there wasn't a formal means for the U.S. to resettle them in the country. Um, and so what would happen is. The, gov- the, the, the government would use uh, an executive authority called parole to basically say, okay, these are emergency circumstances. We are going to create this temporary status for you where we'll technically allow you to come into the United States. You're here. We've, we've brought you here. And now there's this conundrum of, okay, well, what do we do now that you're here? There, at the time, what, we, what repeatedly happened was the US government would parole all of these populations into the US following major international incidents. You know. Uh, Hungarians in the 50s, Soviet yeah. Jews in the late 70s, whatever. Um, they would arrive in the US and then Congress would have to pass an act um, called an Adjustment Act to basically say, okay, we are now giving you, we are now supplying a path to legal status for you. Parole alone was just a temporary measure to get you here. Now we have to actually create a kind of legal infrastructure for you to plug into. And so this, as you can imagine, gets very chaotic and very burdensome. And so one of the things that led to the creation of the 1980 Refugee Act was the realization that, you know, one, we need to get in step with international human rights law and immigration law, where there are very clearly set forth principles of, you know, protection that should be afforded to people who show up at at a country's borders. But the idea was to be more systematic and rigorous about 
how it dealt with large populations of people who needed to be resettled in the United States. And a big thing that animated how the U.S. government prior to 1980, a big thing that animated how the U.S. government handled these situations involving large populations that a U.S. government would decide, you know, did or didn't merit consideration for being paroled into the United States was Cold War politics. And so what would happen is the United States government would routinely parole in populations that were fleeing communist governments. The ones or, you all or, listed yeah. were, were literally quasi-allies, were feeling guilty about not supporting the Hungarians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. And so what you had was essentially a kind of ad hoc policy of parole that functioned mainly as an outgrowth of you of kind of geopolitics and US foreign policy rather than operating from a principle of you know human rights and immigration law setting forth a sort of objective non-ideological standards for protection mm -hmm. so that's sort of what the what the kind of the sort of immediate factors were that led to the creation of the 1980 Refugee Act the the kind of complication and what's kind of an amazing sort of kink in its history was that at the time, it was not imaginable really to the policymakers that there would suddenly be huge numbers of people showing up at the US southern border. Instead, the expectation was we would be dealing with populations far away who would need to get resettled in the United States, which means the government has some control over A, how many people are coming, B, when and how they come. Um, what was a great wild card, which they didn't anticipate at the time, and what's obviously got us to where we are right now, is the fact that huge numbers of people just showed up at the southern border. And so this is the distinction between refugees and asylum seekers. Refugees have been, in our system, have been processed already so that when they reach the United States, their, their, their legal situation is already arranged or on the path to being normalized. Mm -hmm. Asylum seekers are first showing up at the border and the US government is forced to deal with their claims. And so initially, you know, what the framers of the 1980 Refugee Act thought was, okay, every year we've seen about 2,000 people show up at our southern border. All right, let's be generous. Let's kind of budget for about 5,000 people every year. So mm -hmm. what happens a few, you know, a few weeks after the passage of the 1980 Refugee Act is an incident called the Mariel Boatlift, where, you know, in a matter of months, 125,000 Cubans are start showing up at the you know at the port in Miami for a whole combination of complicated reasons that Fidel Castro has to do with, which we could talk about. Um, and so you know I, I spoke to people who wrote the 1980 Refugee Act who at that moment in time, literally weeks after that was signed into law, traveled to Miami, are staring out at the port in Miami and thinking, my God, what what do we just sign? How, how do we square the values and what we just signed with the operational chaos of you know, tens of thousands of people showing up at, you know, at a port, at a port, at a port of entry, at, a, at the border. So, you know, even from the very beginning, asylum was complicated by these logistics. And, you know, even the, <laughs> but I think this gets to the difficulty and where, why we find ourselves in an inconvenient place here. Even the Cuban context of Fidel you know, Castro fits into a Cold War geopolitical, there's broader coalitional aspects that prevent just the just recurring pattern of not just like inaction, but just kind of like kicking um, the can down the road. So I think the real, and this is what I think really matters here too, like a key part of your book's framework is it's not merely that the Central American countries have experienced state collapse and all these different troubles and all people are showing up. It's that at a literal level, US foreign policy and domestic policy in some respect has played a role in that situation. So like taking us to the 1980s again then, mm -hmm. um, I think give this side of the story, which is where this becomes a little more complicated than a debate over like economic migration, which obviously the US has a semi-contentious relationship with Mexico on those things, but like it can be widely understood once again as there are single men who want to make more and we'll maybe move back. Um, so yeah, help us understand the Central American part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this book is fundamentally about the US and Central America because until very, very recently, Central American asylum seekers have posed kind of the, the biggest challenge to the US asylum and immigration system at the border. And so one of the questions this book sets out to answer is, you know, how did it, how did that situation come to be? Um, because I think you know, the greatest source of exasperation to me and, and, and others who kind of cover these issues is, you know, everyone tunes in from the U.S. border onward, um, often not paying attention to all of the history and geography that precedes that pre precise moment when people show up at the U.S. border. And so for me, first of all, 
you know, you have a situation like what happened in 2014. And from 2014 until really very, very recently, the kind of story was about Central Americans seeking asylum. How does that come to pass? The, the story in the book is basically telling you how year by year from the 80s to the present, uh, this reality has come to pass. And it's the result of a lot of things at once, US foreign policy, US domestic politics, uh, immigration policy and politics. It's created a situation in which, and this is to me the most fascinating aspect of this from a reporting perspective, the, the worlds of the US and Central America are fully fused together. And you know they've obviously always been, the US is a major kind of pole in the, in the region. Of course, it's always gonna be magnetic to people, but um, really from the 80s, I would say on, a special relationship formed between the United States and Central America where lives were truly blended between both places. Mm -hmm. um, people, you can't understand, I mean, the way I've come to see this is you can't really understand aspects of American life without thinking about Central America. And you certainly can't understand key aspects of Central American life without reference to the United States. How does Central um, so America define the United States? Well, um, a huge portion of the immigrant population in the U.S. has come from Central America. Honestly, I mean, you know, Me Mexicans have have always been the largest the, the largest Latino population in the U.S., but not far behind them were Salvadorans. Um, and so, you know, you had you have you know huge immigrant enclaves all across the U.S. West Coast parts of Texas, East Coast uh, of Salvadorans, Guatemalans, Hondurans are scattered in different places. But mm -hmm. you basically have the systematic buildup of you know, real communities with deep ties. And then those ties grow more complicated by the fact that, you know, maybe some of those people, some of some of the older members of, of these communities do or don't have legal status, but certainly their children do. So, you know, there are a huge number of mixed status families in America where you might have parents or older siblings who don't have legal status, but younger siblings and children who do. Um, you know, temporary protected status is something that comes up a lot with Salvadorans, Guatemalans, Hondurans. Um, the, this is a status that has basically existed since 1990, where uh, people have been able to live in the U.S. At, at legally for at two year intervals. Every two years, they have to renew their status. Uh, and the idea is this was a, pretemp a temporary form of protection that could be extended as a result of, you know, an, an earthquake, uh, a civil war. Any, any number of kind of cataclysmic events. Um, now you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of Central Americans with TPS living in the United States. Um, that's been a political fight now for years. Until Trump, both parties kind of agree that those populations were sort of best left alone and that the government should just continually renew TPS for them. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Trump years, that became much more contentious and Trump tried to cancel their TPS status. Then you have this population in limbo. So you have a, a huge segment of American life um, that that lives this kind of limbo reality, um, and a lot of it has to do with you know the Civil War years in Central America. Uh, a fifth of El Salvador moved to the United States during the Civil War years, and so you have a situation in which um, you know the United States is deeply involved in the Civil War in El Salvador for a twelve year period from nineteen eighty to nineteen ninety two, and during that time, the U.S. is creating a new demographic which is a demographic of people fleeing that country for the United States. And so then it goes in both directions. Um, you know, I'm sure you've, this is a, this is a conversation now that ironically Trump has sort of brought into view, but mm -hmm. it's a, a nice opportunity to add some historical context, you know, gangs like MS, their notorious Salvadoran street gang, like MS 13 started in Los Angeles in the eighties, didn't start in El Salvador, didn't start in Central America. Those were Salvadorans who relocated to the United States during the Civil War years, who were kind of brutalized in the inner city by existing gangs. They were kind of low on the totem pole, having just arrived. Mm -hmm. They started to form groups in their own, in, in sort of a form of self-defense. That those groups got hardened over time on, you know, the streets of inner cities in America. And then as they got deported in mass back to Central America, that gang presence metastasized. And so that, in turn, and you know, fast forward twenty years. As that gang grows and people flee violence perpetrated by that gang, you have more refugees showing up at the southern border. And so that border dynamic is something that you can't really understand in 2014 without reference to LA in 1988. Yeah. And, you know, in this last section, speaking of generic centrist 
wisdom here, like my DC think tank urges are telling me to say, okay, Jonathan, so if here's the solution here, it's like a Marshall plan for Central America. Like if, if, if it turns out that, you know, the United States has some like role and relationship in this and this border is complicated maybe we should just like pour it and invest resources, insert a trade deal, this, 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 or that. Why has that, why is that a, not a thing, but why am I not crazy to suspect that that probably wouldn't address some of the underlying tensions, the problems we have here? Yeah. I think, you know, there have been sort of smaller scale efforts like this. Um, during the Obama years, there was this Alliance for Prosperity, where over the span of a few years, something like $750 million went to the region in an effort to, you know, do good government reform and, mm -hmm. you, you know, um, deal with certain factors like climate change and, and all the rest. Uh, it's never amounted to much. Um, I think there are a few reasons why. Um, and I would be lying if I if I if I said I could give a definitive account as to as yeah. to why. I mean, I think this stuff kind of it, it now defies a clean accounting. It's just too many years of complexity. <laughs> but like I think one fact is, you know, there is a cultural legacy to mass migration between the US and Central America. And you don't once that is a fact of life in different places, it's not that doesn't just go away. I mean, there's a certain people's lives and families are spread over these different places. And so, you know, there, there are even ways in which you can make life more appealing in certain parts of Central America, but it, the United States is too much of a presence already in certain people's lives for it to ever be fully off the table. Um, but then I think the kind of more concrete answers to your question are, you know, government corruption is very complex and hard to root out. It requires on the US side, uh, a kind of shared sense of mission from Democratic to Republican administrations, and that's mm -hmm. not been the case. And so, you know, to take a very kind of noted example in Central America, there was a, a, a pretty widely lauded uh, anti-corruption effort in Guatemala that began, you know, that, that actually made major inroads in the country in fighting corruption. That was a big project of the United States and the United Nations, and under Trump, got completely kneecapped. Um, and that wasn't just—I mean, some of that was Trump being Trump, but some of that was also you know, conservative Republicans in the Republican establishment having a certain uh, unease with the nature of that project. And so it's very hard to root out corruption, you know, that's built up over decades when there isn't a kind of common denominator on the U.S. side as to which projects are, are, are worth American money and time and investment. Um, so there, so there's, there's that. Um, there's the fact that you know, it's not just a function in some of these countries of the corruption of their governments, but also the business elite. How does what role should the U.S. have in trying to sanction this collusion between corrupt members of government and an entrenched business elite? If that's further complicated by the fact that you know the U.S. has a very troubled history in this region, it's toppled. It's quite, quite literally toppled governments. It's not only you know aided and abetted repressive governments, but like to stick with the Guatemala example in 1954, literally toppled a. Uh, a democratically elected government. So there's also, you know, we have to, we do have to think twice before we kind of suggest that the U.S. just kind of blithely get involved in these other countries' affairs. I mean, there's a checkered history there that we need to be aware of. So anyway, th there are all these kinds of things, and I think, mm -hmm. I think the kind of bottom line is there isn't the political will on the U.S. side to deal with this in a sustained way. There isn't a clear constituency for it, honestly. The political parties, certainly the Republicans, benefit from border chaos. And as we're seeing now, that is an explicit part of their agenda. Democrats are at best wishy-washy, um, at worst contradictory and hypocritical on you know certain aspects of immigration and asylum. It's a, you know, the Democratic Party itself is full of different segments that have differing views on this. Uh, and so I think it's been very hard to basically have a kind of real sense of mission here that, look, the best way to improve conditions uh, would be to invest money, to partner with foreign governments. That's something that's going to take you know, a decade, say, minimum. Um, mm -hmm. And during that time, you have these acute political stressors at the US border and beyond that have such massive reverberations in the American political system that it's sort of hard to get any government to stay on point for long enough to deal with this in a sustained way. Um, so it's it's just, I, I mean, I, again, I, I'm overwhelmed myself. I mean, I've spent a great deal of my professional life now trying to wrestle with this. And I, I don't know that there's a single clear solution. Um, what I think would be more valuable mm -hmm. would be recognizing the inevitability that we live in a world defined by mass migration and that there need to be ways of managing the flow of migrants 
in both directions to the US and back, um, rather than trying to stop it outright. Um, now that sounds kind of sentimental and cheesy, but actually has like a very set of a very concrete set of policy options. The problem is getting people to to, to see that and to fight that fight uh, when you know the political stakes are so high. So two questions. Then so one: to what degree has busing uh, asylum seekers to Denver, Chicago, New York City changed the politics of this? Because that's honestly. Uh, I think within the, de it, it was a really brilliant, this putting aside the morality debate, it was like a brilliant move because I think in ways that I don't suspect like Greg Abbott and like Ron DeSantis understood, it really hit the center of the Democratic Party's coalition on this issue and put everyone kind of in a weird place. So I'm curious like what your kind of perception of that issue has been. I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. I think that, I think the busing has been more than maybe any other factor in recent days recent years yeah. has um, really changed the politics of this issue among Democrats. I mean, the idea that you had key Biden allies in blue cities, most notably in New York City, attacking the president for, I mean, quote unquote, failing New York, you know, mm -hmm. things like that um, really spooked the White House for one thing. And it's a real problem. I mean, we have to call it, we can't pretend that it's not a problem. I mean, it's a real strain on resources for these cities. It's a real issue. There isn't an obvious solution. And it, what it's effectively done is it's taken uh, a border issue and it's 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 magnified it and turned it into an issue in the interior of the country. Um, and I think one of the reasons this present moment is so interesting, I mean, it's all sort of dashed by this Republican gamesmanship in Congress. But what's so striking about these negotiations right now that are playing out in the Senate is you have the White House and Democratic Senate leadership at the table with a willingness to make changes to the asylum system that they wouldn't have touched years ago. Um, the idea that Joe Biden just the other day, I mean, this deal isn't, hasn't even been, the details of this current negotiation haven't even been announced yet. Um, I don't know, you know what's gonna happen with the specifics of the deal, but um, we do know some planks that have been agreed on by both mm -hmm. sides. The idea that before the full kind of panoply of things that have been agreed to has come out and has been presented by the negotiators themselves, that you would have the president of the United States who campaigned against Donald Trump's inhumanity at the border and, and towards immigrants in general, that he would give a preemptive uh, statement on Friday saying, this bill would allow me to shut the border down if the numbers become overwhelming. And I intend to do that as soon as this bill is signed into law. The fact that you would have a Democratic president, again, who campaigned four years ago on the precise opposite, uh, would be saying this now as a way of proving that he's tough and serious and trying to sort of flip the script on Republicans is utterly striking. And I think is a real sign of how this busing incident and how the continued numbers of the border really are posing real ch serious challenges to the Democrats. Quick question, because this is, I have a lot of Republican um, Senate staffer friends, and they were very annoyed at that Biden statement um, because pushback is like, why can't you shut down the border now? Like, why, why does, because as we've discussed, you know, there's a whole set of issues with processing and where do people go and all those different issues, but those are kind of different than people crossing over the border and the fencing dispute uh, between Texas and the federal government. Why can't, the Biden administration just say like, hey, and what's, this isn't how you'd practically do this, but why can't the Biden administration say, hey, like we're just completely razor wiring and placing, uh, you know, a national guardsman like every twenty feet, and no one's getting through? Like, why, why, why do, why does he need new new legislation to to actually shut it down? Well, I mean, the border to, to, to shutting down the border. I, I'm never entirely clear, honestly, on what on what that means. Like, are you shutting it down? Yeah. You know, so that's just that, that, your... what we're getting at is this is somewhat incoherent as a concept. I mean, it's, right. So, and there, so there, there, there are two ways of answering that question, and it's important to have. I mean, I, I it, I'm glad you asked because it's like we got to hash this stuff out. Um, so, two ways of answering that. I would say, first of all, you know, a kind of a, on a general level, there are, to my mind, almost like two sort of fantasy scenarios that you hear coming primarily out of Republican Congress, which is one, we need to detain everyone who crosses illegally. And two, we need to just shut the border down. Now, the first issue, detaining everyone, is physically impossible and is actually practically nonsensical. And if you talk, uh, don't don't take my word as like a progressive-minded writer person, you know, talk to, honestly, ICE officers or border patrol agents. They think that's ridiculous because they're dealing operationally with the fact that there's just a limited amount of space to detain people. 
So then if your goal is to detain everyone or even to do what Republicans are calling for, just detain single adult men, well, then you might be releasing certain people who, or, or, or sorry, um, Republicans are saying detain families. That's our problem, detain families. Well, then who are you releasing in order to detain those families? You're reducing, you're releasing single adult men. I mean, it's just this constant trade-off. It's, it, there's no way to detain everyone. It would require mammoth budgets and Republicans themselves aren't willing to authorize those. So like, similarly, when I, when I hear Republicans say, well, just shut down the border. I, I don't know what it means to shut down, you know, a, a border that is geographically and topographically, you know, mountainous desert, you know, runs through water um, that is, you know, over 2000 miles long. Um, there are also, you know, ports of entry where, you know, hundreds of thousands, about millions of people are passing every day to conduct daily business. What does that mean? Are you shutting that down? You can't, that would, that would, that, that would bring much of the economy to a standstill. So there are these things, which I just, I just don't know what it means when they say that. The, to, to then answer in the second kind of general category, what is it meant when we, we've got, when the government has gotten as close to quote unquote, shutting down the border as possible? I think what we've seen, what I understand the kind of past incident of that to be was this policy called Title 42, um, which the Trump administration put into place at the start of COVID uh, in 2020. And the idea was that, you know, they invoked this obscure public health authority in 2020 to say that we have to end asylum at the border. You know, if someone shows up at the border and we apprehend them, we're not giving them a chance to lodge any kind of claim. We are quite simply turning them around. We are expelling them. We're sending them right back into Mexico and or we're deporting them to their home country. Um, there's a lot to say about that particular policy, um, but it continued through the early years of the Biden administration before it was eventually wound down. Mm -hmm. During those years, there was a huge number of people who continued to show up at the border. It actually led to more repeat crossings because people who in the past would get detained, processed, and either admitted or deported now would just get pushed back into Mexico, they had no reason not to try again. So the numbers exploded. So here's so an, not a, here's so a, the key thing is it's not a deterrent. It, it almost literally the opposite. I mean, it's actually, if anything, an encouragement for people to try to cross multiple times. It brings more chaos to the border than not. And so uh, this stuff doesn't map neatly into, you know, that that's, that's one of the things. What, I mean, it's, it's very interesting from the Biden perspective because I think there was real anxiety inside the upper reaches of the Biden administration to let go of an authority like this Title 42, because mm -hmm. ostensibly it's a silver bullet, right? You have a political problem at the border. You know, your poll numbers look terrible when there are huge numbers of people at the southern border. You're getting, you know, kicked around for it politically. What you want to do is you want to, you know, get these images off the news. You want to clear the border as best you can. This authority seems to give you that power. But when you actually look at how it plays out, it does the opposite. It just means more and more people keep coming and cycling through, trying to cross. And then all the while, you're not building up capacity so that there's only a limited number of border agents you can have. By the way, Congress has refused to fund more border agents. Like there, there, there are contradictions, most specifically on the Republican side. I mean, on both sides, but specifically on the Republican side in this regard, where they refuse to increase funding at the border. And then they ask for these things that would require, you know, I mean, to be totally vigilant along the entire border would require tens of thousands of border agents. I mean, last year, just to give you a sense, yeah. um, the U.S. government added, I believe it was 300 Border Patrol agents to the entirety of the United States Border Patrol. That was the first time the number had been increased since 2011. I mean, just to give Several you a Several crises sense. ago. <laughs> exactly. So- you know, that, that's why I just think this stuff, I don't know how you cut through the noise to get at this kind of complexity. Because again, I, I don't think, I, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that the Democrats have the answers. I don't think really anyone has the answers, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I don't know how, I mean, this is where it's like easier to be a journalist than a policymaker <laughs> for sure, because I, I don't know, I don't know how you deal with this. Um, I mean, my kind of naive hope with, with like a book like this or with reporting is you can just try to show people that this stuff is complicated, that there are human lives involved, that there is like a very complex set of trade-offs in every direction, um, and that the political rhetoric does not match any of that. Um, but yeah, it, this stuff, is, I, I, I certainly don't have the answers. No, and just to 
uh, make it personal for a second. My uh, yeah. uncle-in-law on Facebook posted, uh, he's from South Carolina. He's very conservative. He posted a picture of people like streaming across the border. One of the things people probably seen um, on Twitter. And he was sort of like, hey, to my liberal friends, like, why is this okay? Mm -hmm. um, and very eloquent phrasing, seriously, because it actually gets at the difficulty of the political environment. I think like the work that you're doing, and I think in this conversation, I think from a good faith perspective, it makes clear that like no one actually thinks that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's just incredibly difficult. And the awkward reality for him next year if President Trump wins is that he isn't quite going to have an answer to it either, aka we're going to be in a circular situation. Or, or, and this is the real problem with the Trump administration, how they handle this policy, or any punitive measures they take are going to be so just going too far the other direction that they're clearly going to provoke a like pro migrant backlash because that's literally what we saw happen during the Trump era. Um, they were just unable to kind of find whatever that like moderate center right position was, and instead they let Stephen Miller take the reins. Then you then see backlashes. Um, that's mm -hmm. the difficulty. So here's the final um, question here. The final question here is: You really um, in the first chapter make this like very important point that like look, 2014, 2019, 2021, mm -hmm. three different administrations, mm -hmm. escalating crises. This is clearly the trend that we're really seeing here. And when you put that trend on top of the fact that so much of Western industrialized democratic politics broadly have been organized around immigration backlashes, like AFD in Germany, you know, Le Pen in France, um, this is just going to be probably be one of the issues when people write about the first half of the 21st century, like a hundred years from now. Where do you kind of see this ending? Where do you see this going? This just seems to just be it. It's been 20 plus years. I mean, it's gotten, I mean, it really has gotten worse and worse. Uh, you know, this this book also goes through the different ways in which anxiety over immigration has played out politically. I mean, from the 80s on, and, you know, certainly you could go back much farther in history to show the full sweep of this. You know, I have to say it's, you know, when you, when you, when you pan out and look beyond the United States, you, again, as, as, you, as you're alluding to, you see, you know, England is struggling with this. France is struggling with this. The European Union is struggling with this. Countries in the Americas are struggling with this. I mean, it's just, um, it, it's, it, it is the, I, I, you know, my view of this has always been that sort of this and, and some degree climate change are like the, def will be the defining issues of our lifetimes. Um, and I don't, I don't think that this issue is, I, I mean, all, all I'm seeing is on the American side is the conversation getting narrower and narrower, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that I think is maybe the most alarming thing because the global trend is getting more, it's getting vaster and vaster and increasingly complex. And so the fact that the kind of political discourse is is shrinking down into a kind of willful myopia at a moment when the world historical nature of this problem is just kind of growing in significance, it scares me. It honestly does. That it's is a terrible uh, note to end on. <laughs> no, I, was, I was just going to say, um, actually, here's what we'll end on. Uh, this is yeah. a great book and this is a great conversation. Uh, so can you shout out you. the book? That's the, pos the positive note for <laughs> listeners you. is that thank if you, you weren't depressed to the ends of the earth, you could pick up the actually really great, great, great book. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me on The Realignment.